Hey, what's up guys? Pastor Seth here. Thanks so much for joining us today. And I hope you guys had a very Merry Christmas today, the day after Christmas, uh, Boxing Day for those of you who celebrate. Happy Boxing Day to you. And I'm just excited to share a, an awesome message to you today from a great friend, a pastor friend of mine, Pastor Matt Keller. Uh, he pastors Next Level Church in Fort Myers in Florida. And he and his, his, his wife, his family, uh, their ministry has had a great impact on my life and my wife's life and our family and actually for us as a church. And you're going to hear more about that in just a moment. And I just want to challenge you today with this idea of your next step. You know, what, what does that look like? Because it's the day after Christmas, you're probably like had too much, you know, eggnog or too much ham. You know, you're trying to just, you know, kind of get back into the swing of things. And you're starting to think, hey, next year is only a week away, you know, and maybe some of you are looking this week to make some goals. I don't know, you know, like what that looks like for you. And so we often are thinking, okay, so what's next? And so I, I just wanted to share that today is what's next? And Pastor Matt's been challenging you on looking at four ways to grow in your leadership. Um, and this applies to everyone's watching today. So you now if you're a student, or you're a mom and dad, or you're in your retirement age, whatever it may be, um, there's always a next step for us. So what's next for you? So uh, I know you're going to be challenged and encouraged by this message. And we're looking forward to being back in person with you guys next week. Uh, but enjoy today. Uh, we are titled today Pajama Sunday because you get to stay at home and watch this in your pajamas. And so, hey, love you guys. And thank you for your continued prayers for my dad. Please don't stop. And hey, let us know how we can be praying for you guys as well. And hey, love you guys. So have a great week. And hey, if I don't see you before, then have a happy New Year. All right, guys, enjoy this. God bless you guys. Have a great week. This is Janie, and I want to welcome you here online at Restoration Church. We exist to lead people to become fully engaged followers of Jesus. And if you are joining us for the first time, we are honored that you are with us. We would love to connect with you at rechurch.tv slash connect. We also want to thank you for your continued generosity here at Restoration, where we live to give. The easiest way you can give is by going to rechurch.tv slash give or text give to 845-209-1313. To get more information on how you can take the next steps here at Restoration, simply visit us at rechurch.tv. Thanks again for tuning in and we hope this message today will be the peace and encouragement you need. everybody. Hey, my name is Matt Keller and my wife Sarah and I are the founding and lead pastors of Next Level Church in Fort Myers, Florida, Southwest Florida. And we're also the founders of the Next Level Relational Network, which is a network of churches that your church is a part of. And so you need to know that every single month, your pastors are in small groups with other pastors. And we call them brotherhood and sisterhood groups, an opportunity monthly 
for your pastors to be poured into and to have relationship with others who are ministry leaders just like they are. And so uh, not only are they a part of the Next Level Relational Network, but your church is a part of the Next Level Relational Network. And we exist to pastor ministry leaders so they can lead healthy and high impact churches. And so a few times a year, what we love to do is not just pour into your pastors, but also pour into you, church. And I just want you to know we believe in you. We pray for you. We love you. We're so thankful for the way you serve the vision of your local church where God's called you to in your city and in your region. So this is one of those times, one of those teachings. And so I want to get right to it because I want to pour into you today a word that that God laid on my heart. And I actually taught this to one of our churches in, in New Jersey outside of Philadelphia to some of their key leaders and their staff. And man, it was like one of those words where it was like, wow, that's a word. So then I came home and like the next week taught it to our church staff and was like, you guys got to hear this word. And it comes from Daniel chapter one. And I believe this is a word for every single one of us. So Daniel chapter one, of course, is the story of, we know this, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And let me give you a little context. Uh, basically, uh, they find them, the children of Israel were taken captive and, and they find themselves as captives, as non-free people in Babylon. And so when they get there, the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, wants to develop some of these high potential leaders for his kingdom. And so I want us to see this. And, and what I want us to see today really is four characteristics of a leader that God uses in a great way. Four characteristics of a leader that God can use in a great way. Let's start reading Daniel chapter one, starting in verse three, says this, then the king, Nebuchadnezzar, ordered Ashpenaz, kind of his chief of staff, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. Then here's what the chief of staff was supposed to do. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. Verse five, the king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years. And after that, they were to enter the king's service. Verses six and seven. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah. Here they are, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names to Daniel, the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. So those are the names that we know. And again, God used these guys in a great way. But it wasn't haphazard. And leaders, that's what I want us to see. Th these leaders made some deliberate choices that resulted in them being found trustworthy to be used by God in a great way. So today I want to give us four characteristics of a leader that God can use. Here's the first one. Number one, did you catch it in the text? They were teachable. Number one, verse four tells us, it says, he was to teach them. Yes, these guys, when we study them, they had raw talent, but they, they needed to be teachable because they were now in a system that they didn't know. They had to learn a new language. They had to learn new customs, new ways and means of doing everything. They were now in Babylon, a culture and a, and a country, a place that they didn't understand. And church leaders, here's what I want us to understand today. The landscape of the local church in America, in Canada, across the world has changed because of COVID-19. The coronavirus and the season we've been through, this global pandemic has absolutely changed the local church as we know it for good. It, a lot of uh, church historians and smart people who study this sort of thing tell us that as you study church history, about every hundred years or so, the church of Jesus Christ goes through a, a fundamental shift. And you can study this back to scripture. You can study this in Europe. You can study this in America. Uh, you know, that, that something happens in culture, sometimes man-made, so to speak, an invention like, like the printing press that just changed everything. And all of a sudden, the word of God was able to be in people's hands and not just repeated orally. It changed everything all the way to, to a global pandemic like we've been in. And essentially church historians tell us that about every hundred years or so, there's something that happens that brings a cataclysmic shift, a fundamental shift to the body of Christ and the way the church thinks about and does church globally. 
And leaders, listen, here's what I believe. I believe we're living through one of those shifts. That's what 2020 was. That's what this has been. The, 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 the next 10 years in terms of local church ministry that we're all a part of is not going to look like the last 10 years. And so things that worked in the last 10 years are not going to work. They're not going to be as, as effective in the next 10 years. And so we as leaders have got to be teachable. We've got to embrace teachability because we're in Babylon, baby. Like the landscape of what we're doing and how we're doing ministry and why we're doing ministry has completely changed. So real quick, let me give you three priorities, three priorities of the local church in the next decade. Three priorities. And for us at Next Level Church here in Southwest Florida, we are doubling down on these three priorities. They are this. Number one is discipleship. Discipleship. We have got to drive people deeper into knowing the Word of God. It's all about the word, the word, the word. And man, haven't we experienced that, church leaders? Isn't it amazing that when, when the coronavirus hit, when 2020, the pandemic hit, all of a sudden, we realized who knew the word and had it as the foundation of their life and who didn't. And so I believe in the next 10 years, discipleship is going to matter like crazy. The second thing is community. Community. If 2020 taught us anything, it taught us that we need each other, that relationships are not optional, they are oxygen. And so leaders, listen, everything we're doing in our church, discipleship, community, and then here's the third one. Number three is flexibility. I believe these three characteristics will, will define the church in the next decade. Flexibility. We're going to have to stay and be flexible because we are now strangers in a strange land. We are now residents of Babylon, learning a new language, a new culture, a way, new ways and means of thinking and operating in this foreign land, if you will. And we, the local church and leaders in it, find ourselves there. So we've got to be teachable. Now, uh, several years ago in 2015, I actually wrote a book called The Key to Everything. And the key to everything is teachability, is this first point that we're talking about. These guys were teachable. Four characteristics. The first is teachable. And here's how I define teachability in the book. I, I, I say this, a desire to learn and a willingness to change desire to learn and willingness to change. And so church leaders, I just want to challenge you today. Come on, how's your desire to learn? Let's stay let's stay teachable. Let's stay open. And and then a willingness to change. Let's don't be stuck in our ways. I believe doing ministry in the next decade is going to require that you and I are willing to change how we think about. Well, we've always done it that way. We've always what uh, hey Come on, let's stay open. Let's stay teachable. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were teachable. Here's the second characteristic. We're talking about four characteristics of a leader that God can use in a great way. The second one is, number two, they were trained. They were trained. Did you catch it? He said, it's, the scripture said that, that the king told Ashpenaz, you are to train them for three years. Now that's a lot of training. They were to be trained for three years that the king understood in order for them to really be effective in this new culture, they're going to have, they, they're going to have to be trained very strategically and specifically for three years. This was no small training regimen. This was not, yeah, go to a few Sunday afternoons of classes and you'll be fine. You can leave. No, no, no. There was a depth to what these leaders had to learn. And Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego embraced that training. They, they didn't push against the training. They embraced it. And leaders, listen, it's going to take a while for us to, to relearn what we're doing and how we're, we're going to be effective doing ministry now in a post-pandemic world and culture that we find ourselves in. And so I just want to challenge you today. Come on, church leaders. I want to challenge you today to embrace the training. And, and here's, let me say it this way. Let me, let me get very specific in terms of you and your pastors and your church. There is a very specific recipe or ingredient list, if you will, that God has put in your church in your house. It's like, it, it, I, like I think about chocolate chip cookies and there's all kinds of chocolate chip cookies. Some of us growing up, your mom or your grandma, you know, made uh, chocolate chip cookies and there was a secret ingredient, right? And like, she's like, I will never tell anybody my secret ingredient, right? Or, or you know, there's Chips Ahoy, and then there's Chewy Chips Ahoy, right? There's Mrs. Fields, there's Chick-fil-A chocolate chip cook, right? There's all kinds of, and each one tastes a little different, doesn't it? Well, see, the same thing is true in terms of of the culture of our of our churches of our of our houses 
that there's a specific recipe that God has placed inside of your church. And the Bible makes it very clear that the anointing flows down. In other words, God has placed that, that recipe, that ingredient list, so to speak, for the unique culture that is your house, your church that God's planted you in. And he's placed it inside of the heart of your pastors. And so here's what that means. That means if, if we're going to be effective at, at making the chocolate chip cookies the way God wants us to make them in our house specifically, then we've got to figure out what that recipe is. We've, we've got to pay attention to that because God's placed that recipe inside of your pastors. And so listen, it's not that they're better than anybody else. No, 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 no. It's just that they're, they're seeing it first. It's not that they see it better. They just see it first. And God's called them as the leaders to communicate that vision, that recipe, that culture, that heart of your house to all of you as leaders so that you can run with it and pass it on to everybody else that leads inside of your local church. So how do we do that? How do we, how do we grab a hold of the recipe? How do, we, how do we get close to the recipe? Three quick thoughts. Number one, ask questions. Ask questions. Staff, let me encourage you. Ask questions of your leaders because I promise you they have thoughts, not micromanaging kind of thoughts. No, no, no. They have thoughts about, about kids ministry. They have thoughts about your greeter teams, your parking lot, your worship. They have thoughts about student ministry. Every component of your church, God's placed inside of them that recipe. So number one, ask your leaders questions. You're not annoying them. And listen, how you ask and when you ask matters even more than what you ask. Come on, isn't it true, leaders? There's a tone to a question, right? Like when somebody walks up to you in the foyer and goes, so I have a question. Oh, good, <laughs> right? It's like, what's your question, right? But then it's it, then you could say, wait a minute. Someone else says, I have a question. And you can feel it, right? You can feel the tone of that. So number one, ask questions. Number two, here's, here's how I, I, I said it. Become a noticer, not just a doer. Come on, leaders, there's so much that we're doing. There's so much on a weekly basis every Sunday. We're just pouring ourselves out and we're, we're leading things. We're doing things. What I would say is become a noticer. Become a noticer. Ask the Lord to help you start seeing why we're doing things the way we're doing them, not just what we're doing. Does that make sense? So ask questions, become a noticer. The third thought in terms of training in your specific house is invite feedback. Invite feedback from your leaders. One of the greatest ways for us to get better and embrace teachability and, and embody the culture of the house God's planted you in is by inviting feedback. Say to your leaders, hey, help me lead that meeting better. What did you notice about when I did announcements this week? How can I do it better? When I was leading worship, when I was standing up doing that, when I preached that, when I taught those, those leaders, when I, when I led that huddle, invite feedback from your leaders. That's how we get better. So we're talking about four characteristics of a leader that God uses greatly. They're teachable. Number two, they're trained. Here's the third characteristic I want us to see. They were a team. They were a team. Did you see it in verse six? It said, among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The four of these guys saw themselves as a team not as, as, as loners, that they preferred each other. They knew each other's strengths and weaknesses. They helped each other. They shared best practices. They, they, when, you, when you study these guys, they didn't grow in a silo. They grew and developed together as a team. And listen, church staffs, can I just tell you, that's what God wants for us as well. We are better together. And each one of us has strengths and weaknesses. And the best teams know each other's strengths and weaknesses. The best teams know who's the right person to pass the ball to at the right time. Who's the, the right person to, to take that shot? Well, she's better at this. Well, then, man, when the game's on the line, pass it to her. Let her take the shot. Well, well he's more capable of in this area. That's his strength. Well, then pass the ball to him to run with those details and to manage that thing. Of course, the best team teams know each other's strengths and weaknesses. The best teams prioritize the team's success over their own advancement, over individual success. Think about the best teams. The best teams, whether it's hockey or football or baseball or soccer, whatever the team you think about, the best teams always prioritize the team success over individual success. So here's what that means. Listen, leaders, we got to leave our, our individual stats at the door. We got to check our individual accolades and titles and recognition. No, no, come on. In the body of Christ, there's nothing. We don't have time for that. There's too much at stake. There's too many lost people. 
See, the best teams prioritize the team's advancement and achievement over their own personal advancement. And the best teams learn from each other. The best teams learn from each other. When, when you see a team that's really gelling, that's really clicking, that's really making a difference and winning, guess what? That's a team that's passing information. They're not hoarding information. They're, they're working together constantly. They're passing details to one another. They're, they're passing best practices and learnings. And so listen, the room you're sitting in right now, the team that you're on, I want you to know, come on, you got to know each other's strengths and weaknesses. You got to prioritize the team and then be open and, and be t learning from one another. So we're talking about four characteristics of a leader that God can use in a great way. Here's number four. Number four is they were tested. They were tested. Look at verses 11 to 14. It says, Daniel then asked, uh, said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over him and his buddies, please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. These leaders were tested. And what I think is so fascinating about this is Daniel asked for it. He went to the, to the chief guard on behalf of the other three guys. And he said, hey, for us as a team, listen, we want to be tested. We, Daniel chose to sacrifice like other leaders wouldn't or didn't. They asked to be tested. Come on, leaders. What if the amount of harvest we are able to see in our church is connected to how much sacrifice and pain we're willing to endure? They asked for it. They said, test us. And listen, I get it. The last year... This whole pandemic season has been a massive test for all of us. Well, can it, is it possible that whom the Lord has tested greatly and is testing greatly, he is also setting up for a great harvest? That's what I believe. That's what I believe is coming to your church. I believe the best days of harvest are coming for all of our churches. Come on, in Jesus' name. But here's what it means. We gotta, we, we've got we've to embrace the test. We got to stop rolling our eyes. We got to stop shaking our fist at God. We got to stop asking why and just start saying, Lord, if, bring on the test because I want to be useful in your kingdom. Four characteristics. And then here's, here's what I want us to see from the story. They, they were, their result was twofold. Look at the result. The first result was they were trusted. They were trusted. Verses 15 to 17. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nursed than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. Then here's a statement. Look at this. To these four young men, God, not any human, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. Leaders, here's what I want us to see. God trusted them with wisdom and insight that others didn't get because of the first four things they prioritized, because they were teachable, because they were willing to be trained, because they saw themselves as a team and not just individuals, because they, they embraced the test, God could trust them with influence. God could trust them with insight. See, here's the thing. Everybody wants to run to trust him. Everybody goes, God, trust me with God. Give me, God, grow my youth ministry. God, grow my worship ministry. God, grow our church. God, God, we want to be trusted with more influence, but we don't want to embrace the first four. We just want to run straight to this and be like, God, trust me with more. And God's going, great, will you be teachable? Are you willing to be trained for three years? Like, are you willing to play the long game here, staff member? Are you willing to, to put down your individual goals and hopes and dreams and ambitions? And, and just be a part of the team and say, what's in it for the team? What can God do with us together? Are you willing to be tested? Because if so, then you're capable of being trusted. And that's what I love about these guys. And then here's the second result. The second result is they were 10 times better. They were 10 times better. Look at verses 18 to 20. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service. So three years later, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar, the king. The king talked with them and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. Right here, look at this. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them 10 times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. 
over a long period of time, because they embraced those four characteristics, there was a compounding effect to their leadership. And I believe the same thing is true for us. I don't know about you. I don't want it to be just a little bit better. Come on, don't you want to be a leader that's found 10 times better? What could God do in our church? What could God do in our midst if he, he could find us 10 times better? That's my prayer for you team members. That's my prayer for you, staff. That's my prayer for you, network family, that we would be the kind of churches that are found trustworthy and 10 times better, not for our glory, but for His, not for our sake, but for the harvest's sake. God, find us trustworthy, and God, would you trust us to be 10 times better for you? Let me pray for you, staff. Father, I thank you for our network family. God, I thank you for our churches. I thank you for our pastors. Lord, we lift up our arms and we pray for each of our lead pastors. Lord, you see these couples and the, the burden they carry, their heart that they have, the love that they have for all of us as team members. Lord, we pray blessing and encouragement over them today. And then God, we pray as team members that Lord, you would help us to embrace these four characteristics God, we want to be found faithful like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We want to be leaders for you, Lord Jesus, who can be trusted and can be 10 times better. So Lord, would you help us to embrace the test? God, would you help us to lay individual achievement aside and embrace our team? Our team? God, would you train us everything we need to know about the house you've planted us in? God, would you make us teachable, willing to learn? Father, I bless these team members today. I bless their churches. May everything they set their hand to be found trustworthy and 10 times better. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We love you. Thank you for joining us today. If you are new with us or you said yes to Jesus today, connect with us at rechurch.tv slash online. Let us know how we can pray for you at rechurch.tv slash prayer. And thank you for your continued generosity. We give out of the overflow of our heart. Giving is an act of worship that expresses our gratitude, faith, and love for others. You can give by text and give to 845-209-1313 or online at rechurch.tv slash give. To keep updated on what's happening here at Restoration, text RECHURCH to 84576 or visit us at rechurch.tv.